And welcome back, guys, to the Bible reading. And for those joining in week to week, I know you're like, we've been waiting. We've had uh, life things going on, vacations, uh, jobs, everything that you can ask for to happen. But it's kept us a little busy. But we are back to continue our journey here through numbers as we dive back in. And since many of you will be watching this in the future uh, and not present time, we're just going to keep rolling into it. We'll talk more about that other stuff on the podcast. So without further ado, JD, I'm going to let you go ahead and take over. We're going to bring the Bible up on screen and take yeah, us yeah, off. Yeah. And there you go. Awesome. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. We're in Numbers chapter 7, 89 verses to this chapter. So it's quite a long chapter. Buckle up and we continue on. The offerings at the tabernacle's consecration. And on the day when Moses had finished setting up the tabernacle, the tabernacle and had anointed and consecrated it with all its furnishings and had anointed and consecrated the altar with all its utensils, the chiefs of, the, the chiefs of Israel, heads of their father's houses, who were the chiefs of the tribes, who were over those who were listed, approached and brought their offerings before the Lord. Six wagons and 12 oxen, a wagon for every two of the chiefs and for each one an ox. They brought them before the tabernacle. And then the Lord said to Moses, accept these from them that they may be used in the service of the tent of meeting and give them to the Levites, to each man according to his service. So Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon, according to their service. And four wagons and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari, according to their service, under the direction of Itamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. But the sons of Kohath he gave none, because they were charged with the service of the holy things that had to be carried carried on the shoulder and the chief and the chiefs offered offerings for the dedication of the altar on the day it was anointed and the chiefs offered their offering before the altar and the lord said to moses they shall offer their offerings one chief each day for the dedication of the altar and he who offered his offering the first day was nashon the son of amin Ab Aminadab of the tribe of Judah, and his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, and one male lamb a year old. For a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and the sacrifice of peace offerings. Two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Amin Adam. And on the second day, Nathanael, the son of Zuar, the chief of Issachar, made an offering. He offered his offering one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels and one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Both of them full of fine flour with oil for a grain offering. One golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense. One bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering. And for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. And this was the offering of Nathanael, the son of Zuar. And on the third day, Eli Eliab, Eliab, the son of Helon, the chief of the people of Zebulun, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to to the shekel of the sanctuary. Both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. One golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense. One bull from the herd. One ram, one male lamb, a year old for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering. And for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs, a year old. And this was the offering of Eliab, the son of Helon. 
And on the fourth day, Elizur, the son of Shedir, the chief of the people of Reuben, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels and one silver basin of 70 shekels according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. One golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, five male lambs a year old. And this was the offering of Elizur, the son of Shedur. And on the fifth day, Shelumil, the son of Zurish Adai. So that's yo, these names again, eh? tongue twisters. Zurish Adai, the chief of the people of Simeon. And his offering plate was, whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And both of them were full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. One golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats and five male lambs a year old. And this was the offering of Shelumil, the son of Zurishadai. And on the sixth day, Eliasaph, the son of Deul, the chief of the people of Gad, and his offering was a silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of flour, fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. One golden dish of 10, 10 shekels full of incense. One bull from the herd, one ram, and one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering and for the sacrifice of peace offerings. And five rams, five male goats, five male lambs a year old. And this was the offering of Eliasaph, the son of Deo. And on the seventh day, Elishama, the son of Amihut, chief of the people of Ephraim. And this offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. One golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering. And for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats and five male lambs a year old. And this was the offering of Elishama, the son of Ami. And on the eighth day, Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur, the chief of the people of Manasseh, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And both of them were full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. One golden dish of ten, sh 10 shekels full of incense. One bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering. And one male goat for a sin offering. And for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five lambs, male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Gamaliel, the son of Perezur. And on the ninth day, Abidan, the son of Gideoni, the chief of the people of Benjamin, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And both of them were full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, a golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. And this was the offering of Abidan, the son of Gideoni. And on the tenth day, Ahizer, the son of Amishadai, the chief of the people of Dan, and his offering was a silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. 
and both of them were full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. One golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, and one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Ahizer, the son of Amishadai. And on the 11th day, Pagil, the son of Okran, the chief of the people of Asher, his offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And both of them were full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. One golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. And this was the offering of Pagil, the son of Okran. And on the 12th day, Ahira, the son of Enan, the chief of the people of Naphtali, this offering was one silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, one golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense, one bull from the herd, one ram, one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Ahira, the son of Enan. This was the dedication offering for the altar on the day when it was anointed. From the chiefs of Israel, 12 silver plates, 12 silver basins, 12 golden dishes, each silver plate weighing 130 shekels and each basin 70. All the silver of the vessels, 2,400 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The 12 golden dishes full of incense weighing 10, she 10 shekels apiece, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And all the gold of the dishes being 120 shekels. All the cattle for the burnt offering, 12 bulls, 12 rams, 12 male lambs a year old, with their grain offering, and 12 male goats for a sin offering. And all the cattle for the sacrifice of peace offerings, 24 bulls, the rams 60, male goats 60, the male lambs a year old 60. This was the dedication offering for the altar after it was anointed. And then, and when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat. And that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim. And it spoke to him. Hey, amen, JD. You made it. You went through that. No breaks, no, no stopping, uh, 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 no side notes, brother, get some water. God bless you, uh, brother, uh, for that one. And, you know, I know that you just went through all that. So I'll give you a moment to catch up with your breath and, and, and take a second. And I just want to add here for those that are actually watching, watching still, and also for y'all that fast forwarded, I know you there, I know you listening because a lot of that was a lot of repetitive. I mean, we, we told you at the beginning of this, this is the census, right? Numbers is a lot of like just, <laughs> it's numbers. It's important information. And it reminds me of recently on the podcast, and I don't know when you're listening to this, we had someone ask about why they struggle reading the Old Testament. And when JD and I were talking, I said, well, you're a Gentile. This information isn't uh, something that you were raised on. And this isn't something you just sit down with and get overnight. Like for us, when yeah. you go through numbers, you're like, wow, this is what you and I go to school for, for a hundred years. What is it? I'm sorry. I said a hundred. I'm being a little uh, arrogant there. 250 years, our U S country. And we go to school for years, learning our history. And we're talking about thousands of years of history contained in the old Testament, right? So there's the reason why the old Testament is so hard sometimes for us is most of us are Gentiles prior to coming to Christ. This is why Paul didn't go around preaching numbers, 
right? He used the Old Testament to preach the gospel. When, when, he, when he was in Athens, he talked about the unknown God. He didn't talk about, you know, the covenants with David because they didn't need that information first. That's why most of us Gentiles, there's the anomaly that's like, yeah, well, I went to the Old Testament first. That's a blessing. Not saying the Old Testament yeah. doesn't lead people to the Lord. However, this is not easy to go through in a moment. I don't have a lot to say about it because it's numbers. It's it's, it's what it is. You yeah, could it's a history sit lesson. here yeah. and go through this in a historical sense. And, and that's not my gift and nor is it my passion. But I do want to mm. remind people of that, J.D., that this is not something that should be like you're going through it and like, oh, I'm having such a blast, which everyone wants the Bible to be that in every chapter. Like, no, this yeah. is the same thing you don't like about your U.S. history sometimes where it's like, all right, that was a little bit just, you know, nonstop, just bat hitting the facts. And that, that's what it is. Yeah, they're right. I mean, that's that's the most important thing to take from this. If you were a young, young Israelite, a young Jew born two, three hundred years after this, this is what you would be taught. This is this is the introduction to, well, this is how we got here. You can just imagine how. Uh, David and then would would be teaching their children and and so on and so forth. So it's it's a history lesson and it's it's accurate. That's that's the main thing. That's that's what we're looking at. So it although it seems at first glance like why is it so repetitive? Because it's showing you that each and every single one of the tri tribes of Israel brought identical sacrifices. There there wasn't one who brought you know a little bit extra to the party. They yeah, brought record keeping. The, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly what it is. So with that being said, guys, this is really what numbers this will be the last time I say it because I feel like I, I do keep repeating that. But I want to just make sure people are aware in important information. Great to do deeper in, in, in study on if you really want to understand Jewish culture, uh, the history, because that also does help you understand scripture. A lot of this as hard as it is to get through, we're going to come back st to stuff here all the time with cross references because numbers and well, most of the Pentateuch is full of so much time that everything later is being referenced back to this five books, right? The prophets are going to constantly be pointing back here. Jesus points here, right? This is what it all points back to because of so much information here. So let's go ahead and roll into it. Numbers chapter eight. And uh, we're starting here. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and say to him, when you set up the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light in front of the lampstand. And Aaron did so. He set up the, its lamps in front of the lampstand and the Lord commanded Moses. And this was the workmanship of the lampstand, hammered work of gold from its base to its flowers. It was hammered work according to the pattern that the Lord had shown Moses. So he made the lampstand. Uh, I just want to stop for a moment and there's not many moments where I find little spots to just point back to, but remember when we see in Exodus, when we were reading through it and it talked about building the ark according to what Moses had seen. And we know that, uh, the scripture says Moses was taken to the heavenly places as far as seeing what these things were to look like, because there's a shadow here is a shadow of what is in the heavenly places. As we read in the, uh, the letter of the Hebrews, it says that, you know, uh, the, Christ went into the Holy of Holies, not built by human hands. So just something here to note, and I'll highlight it on screen, just that um, according to the pattern that the Lord had shown Moses. So everything that Moses was doing when it comes to this, these holy things was matching what God had already established, which is more pointing to the fact that this is not something God did on the, on the fly. This wasn't plan B when Christ came either, but rather what we're talking about is a plan from eternity past. God already set it up in heaven. And then he's like, Moses, make it look like this. So let's keep going. Verse five. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the Levites from among the people of Israel and cleanse them. Thus you shall do to them to cleanse them. Sprinkle the water of purification upon them and let them go with a razor over all their body and wash their clothes and cleanse themselves. Then let them take a bull from the herd and its grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil. And you shall take another bull from the herd for a sin offering. And you shall bring the Levites before the tent of meeting and assemble the whole congregation of the people of Israel. When you bring the Levites before the Lord, the people of Israel shall lay their hands on the Levites 
And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering from the people of Israel, that they may do the service of the Lord. Then the Levites shall lay their hands on the heads of the bulls, and you shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering to the Lord to make atonement for the Levites. And you shall set the Levites before Aaron and his sons and shall offer them as a wave offering to the Lord. Continuing in verse 14. Thus you shall separate the Levites from among the people of Israel and the Levites shall be mine. And after that, the Levites shall go in to serve at the tent of meeting when you have cleansed them and offered them as a wave offering. For they are wholly given to me from among the people of Israel instead of all who open the womb the firstborn of all the people of Israel, I have taken them for myself. And there's a lot of imagery happening here that I'm sure JD can touch on when I get done this chapter, but just some things that really like uh, uh, at least highlight for a moment is going to be the firstborn of all the people of Israel. And we'll, we'll stick with that for now. I've taken them for myself. For all the firstborn among the people of Israel are mine, both of man and of beast. On the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated them for myself, and I have taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel, and I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the people of Israel to do the service for the people of Israel at the tent of meeting and to make atonement for the people of Israel, that there may be no plague among the people of Israel when the people of Israel come near the sanctuary. Chapter, I mean, uh, verse 20. Thus did Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the people of Israel to the Levites, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites, the people of Israel did to them. And the Levites purified themselves from sin and washed their clothes. And Aaron offered them as a wave offering before the Lord. And Aaron made atonement for them to cleanse them. And after that, the Levites went in to do their service in the tent of meeting before Aaron and his sons, as the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites. So they did to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this applies to the Levites from 25 years old and upward. They shall come to duty in the service of the tent of meeting. And from the age of 50 years, they shall withdraw from the duty of service and serve no more. They minister to their brothers in the tent of meeting by keeping guard, but they shall do no service. Thus shall you do to the Levites in assigning them, I mean, in, in assigning their duties. So real quick here. And, and JD, I just want to kind of bounce these things off you because we promised when we first started this that, you know, this will be less Bible study and more just Mike and JD reading the Bible. So I want a Mike and JD reading the Bible moment. Yeah. I go back here and, and as I'm reading it, right, I, I, I see pictures within pictures within pictures, right? So we see these shadows and types. But then, right, we have Israel and this one tribe that he chooses for himself. And I've always, obviously, we've always, we've, we know about the Levites. But we see yeah. that they're to serve Aaron and his sons, the high priest. And we know that Christ is our high priest. And he comes and chooses those out of the world. And we see this imagery even within the structure of Israel of God saving out of the world, his remnant that he yeah. saves out of Israel, right? And, and it's just beautiful that we can see that, at least this is what I see. And I don't know um, what really caught my eye is when we see the same imagery of, you know, Jesus comes, he gets baptized. Why? Because Aaron had to be cleansed as the beginning of the, the high priestly role. We get baptized. Why? Because Aaron's sons get baptized and we like our uh, leader in this high priestly role will will follow him into it and be cleansed. And then we see the Levites who serve the high priest. They get cleansed and given a new uh, clean robes. And we see in Revelation, you yeah, know, yeah. we will be clothed in in this white. And, you, I, you know, I see this this imagery here. So I wonder if you have any input on that. Yeah, it's actually quite mind blowing with um the way this is out, especially as we move now into into the Passover, which comes next, um, and the the provisions made as as you went in for for this Passover feast. So, I mean, even when you get to like nine ten, yeah, um, we see that if if for whatever reason a male couldn't be a participant or wasn't able to partake in the Passover, they would give him. An opportunity to you know celebrate the Passover a, a month later, so this was like again all inclusive, all inclusive. We see even today if you go to Israel, we've we've got the mikveh outside 
uh, you know, the dipping baths where, where people would be made clean for whatever reason they would need to be made clean of. And um, just the, the, the parallels are mind-blowing, especially with imagery. And then there are a lot of people who have like really done deep dives on, on, on these and bringing these parallels to life. But again, as Mike already mentioned, that's not, that's not our wall. That's not where we've put our focus. And that's not where God's put our focus. Let me put it that way. Um, but it is quite, it's quite amazing. Um, what you've just pointed yeah. out there. Have we, have we mentioned that we don't think we know everything in the Bible? I don't know how many times we have, but just a reminder, if you're with us still at yeah. this point, I hope you don't think like, that if you're doing this with us, you got it all. You don't go back. We miss so much. It's like we we can only cover so much, and yet we only know so much. And there's yeah, and and especially in certain parts. Now, don't get me wrong. There's gonna be certain parts that you following along are be like, oh, this is where they know, right? You're gonna see it pick up a lot more differently. But yeah, numbers. This is we're just going through it. Yeah, I mean, we even see like now, like I say, the the latter parts of numbers, and we see God sending the quail um, in to feed them uh their ungratefulness and and despite all the the numbers and everything we're going through yeah there there's something important to take from this book is is regardless of everything god gave them and then he said okay this is the law this is how you'll do it they still went and and did the opposite <laughs> so it's 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 no different today it's no different today in, in, in the body of Christ. It's no different when Paul has told us how we ought to walk, how we ought to talk. Um, and as Christians, um, we fail at that miserably. Um, and that's yeah. just Christendom as a whole, not just you not know, nitpicking all. Yeah. You saying that makes me think about, you know, two different things that we that we see when it comes to the old testament and why people I think deal with it in such a weird way is because they separate it so much and they think that there's this way to be saved under the old covenant. And therefore, you know, I don't want anything to do with the old Testament. So if I just push it away, like, well, that's not for us, right? You got the people that do that. That's yeah. just straight up yeah, yeah. push it away. And then you got the people that go into it thinking, well, wait, this is, this is older. And this is what God said. And they messed up and Jesus came to fix it, but maybe I can do it right now that I know, I know Jesus, I can do it. Right. So they misunderstood what Jesus came to actually do. They don't think that there's, that the, that, the, that the Old Testament bears witness to Jesus, we get the Torah observance, right? They think that the Old Testament has life in it. And the thing is, if you go to this and you read through numbers and you're looking at the wrong place, you'll get the wrong thing from it. You and I look at this and what do we see? We see the history of how, how God operated with his people. We see foreshadowing of things that show the things that we see our God doing. It's almost like reading a journal and seeing your father back before you was alive, like, hey, he did that with us. He... He did that with us too. Like, oh, that's how he did it with them back then. We're looking yeah. at getting to know God, the yeah. author and who, what he did. They're looking at it to analyze these rules. Like, no, learn from history, but we're not going to this to try and be, the, be Israelites. You're, you're not an, yeah. you're not an Israelite. Like, yeah, you can't become an I mean, Israelite. That's the, yeah. That's, that's ultimately where, where these cults have spawned from Hebrew Israelites, the, in, in, and this is the, the craziest thing for me because I've witnessed Hebrew Israelites um, who think they're the chosen tribe or the lost tribe or the, the tribe scattered abroad. And here in South Africa, we've got the same problem with a group of Afrikaans people who think they're Israel. And, and you know, it's, it's literally the, the flip side of Hebrew Israelites because the Hebrew Israelites think that they're the chosen Jesus was black. Everyone's black. The world's black. And if you're not black, you're not, you're not in. And then we've got the same. Yeah. With the, they call themselves Israel vision in Afrikaans is called Israel VC. And um, they believe that no people of color would be saved. It's only the white people that can be saved. So again, it's just so demonic. Um <laughs> Wait, I was uh, muted. I have to jump in. You have the white version of the Hebrew Israelites. We got to get them mixed up with the Hebrew Israelites. That would be bro, a it's hilarious so clash. I would yeah. love to see Jacob and Esau squaring up. And oh, <laughs> oh, I need to, And they from Africa. So they white Africans against all. Oh, I need to see this. Man, it's, it's comical because they also do the whole 
uh, Jesus wasn't his name. It's Yahushua, ha ha wa, hama hama, shaya haya. You know, they've all got these weird names. And if Jesus Christ is a pagan god and a Greek god, and it, it's 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 literally like dam for dam. It's apple for apple, orange for orange. They're exactly the same in their doctrine, just different ethnicities. <laughs> it's so funny. funny. Oh yeah. man, people locked in the flesh. But all right, you get the Passover, which I guess is fair because the first chapter that you got was a long doozy. So I was jealous that you get the Passover, but what a great one to have. So go ahead and uh, I'll go mute and hand it back over to you. Amen. 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 Here we go. Chapter nine, Numbers chapter nine. And the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt. Very important, this little date set here. And, and, and you need to keep note of this for when we get to the New Testament, we might come back to this, this very passage. And the Lord said to Moses, let the people of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. And on the 14th day of this month at twilight, you shall keep it as its appointed time, according to all its statutes and all its rules you shall keep it. And so Moses told the people of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover in the first month. And on the 14th day of the month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded, uh, or all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Sorry, I lost my place there. So the people of Israel did. And there were certain men who were unclean through touching a dead body. So they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron on that day. And those men said to him, we are unclean through touching a dead body. Why are we kept from bringing the Lord's offering at its appointed time among the people of Israel? And Moses said to them, wait, that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel saying, if any one of you or of your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body or is on a long journey, he shall still keep the Passover to the Lord. In the second month on the 14th day at twilight, they shall keep it. So this is what I mentioned earlier on. So, so God is, is, is gracious in the, in, the, in the sense that if for whatever reason you had to bury a loved one or whatever the case may be and you were unclean and you had to keep the, the cleanliness laws, which you've already covered in Leviticus, he would then give an extension a month later at the exact same time and you would keep that Passover. You would have the opportunity to keep the Passover. So they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any of its bones, according to all the statute for the Passover, they shall keep it. But if anyone who is clean and is not on a journey fails to keep the Passover, that person shall be cut off from his people because he did not bring the Lord's offering at its appointed time. And that man shall bear his sin. And if a stranger sojourns among you, you would keep the Passover to the Lord according to the statute of the Passover and according to its rule. So shall he do. You shall have one statute, both for the sojourner and for the native. I love this. What does Paul say in Romans 1? The gospel is, is, is to the Jew first and then also it I was extended to the Greek. I was just about <laughs> to show, uh, say Jesus said salvation comes through the Jews, right? And we yeah. see the command of the Passover, and we've talked about it on the show and on this Bible reading. People say, well, are we supposed to keep the Passover? Because the Bible says keep it forever. And we explained to them that the keeping of the Passover was so that this was never forgotten of what it means, right? That you mm -hmm. are in God's grace and you are passed Amen. over. And Amen. I, what we now know is that Christ is the true Passover lamb. So from our point of view, what do we see here? If nobody, if, if you fail to keep the Passover, Come to Christ, right? Because in Christ, we are protected from uh, 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 the wrath of God. That is the Passover. He is our true Passover, right? He's not the lamb. He's the true Passover, the lamb of God. Any person who does not will be cut off 
and they will bear their own sin. And we know mm -hmm. that. That's what the Bible says. And, and I love the cutoff here, right? Because notice the cutoff here, it reminds me of Romans 11, the olive tree. God's people was the Jew, but he allows mm -hmm. the sojourner to be grafted in, saying that I'll give you a place in the vine. However, if we don't make it to Passover, all y'all can get cut off the graft in and the original, if you don't get in Christ, because being attached to the uh, the vine, not the vine, uh, the, the olive tree isn't what saves us. And we're going to get into olive tree theology way later in the Old Testament, but that's going to play a lot of roles throughout prophetic things, the olive tree and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, just something that I think is beautiful here uh, that I figured you were going to stop about too. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> so he ends off there. And again, just a, a beautiful narrative for the fact that, you know, people that claim that that God was not just um, in the Old Testament and that he was only saving Jews. Um, no, he wasn't. Um, Gentiles being saved through the gospel um, and what the Apostle Paul was preaching is ultimately, as we work through the latter parts of the book of Acts, we see when Paul is even brought to court, he he says it unequivocally i was i was taxed and tasked to kill christians to bring them to justice um and then i saw the lord jesus christ so we know that god's salvation was always for all people um those who were willing to submit themselves to the law of god and place themselves under his statutes and commands so again ultimately none of these things saved but they were a foreshadowing of what was to come so praise Jesus Christ where we are today. And we can look back at this and reflect on, on the grace we actually have received um, to be saved through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah, he talks about the cloud covering um, over the tabernacle. Verse 15, and on the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. And at evening, it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning just just imagine witnessing the sight and and still walking away from god it's it's absolutely mind-blowing so you know when we and when i read numbers nine this is this is all, this is my favorite part of numbers um if you haven't gathered that by now but people often say to me i know they've said it to mike um you know why doesn't god just reveal himself why doesn't god just reveal himself to us um well the reality is is he did and you put him on a cross so Jesus Christ coming down on a cloud today would be no different uh, to those who have unbelieving hardened hearts. They would still reject it. Um, they would probably pass it off as, you know, aliens or optical illusions, whatever the case may be, they wouldn't believe. So that's not enough for someone to believe. And we see even here, you know, fire by night, cloud by day, and still some of these uh, sojourners, some of the Israelites still went against what God had commanded. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after that the people of Israel set out and in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out and at the command of the Lord, they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in the camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. So this was their, indica their indicator. This was their guideline. This was their compass, if you will. Uh, if the cloud covering was over the tabernacle, they did not move. They stayed put. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle. And according to the commandment of the Lord, they remained in the camp. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. And sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning. And when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. So again, just very specific with the details here. Um, and that's why we see repetition throughout numbers. Um, we'll also see a lot of repetition as we go to Deuteronomy of, of what we've already read in in leviticus so let it's, me it's just yeah let me quickly just hop in here and just show again remember we i know that we've been emphasizing this this is going to be our phrase this year who is god right 
what do we what do we also see here? What what is JD emphasizing to you in our podcast episode? Who is God? One of the names was the God who is there, who is there from the moment he saves them. He is with them. He is with them in the wilderness. He is with them on their journey to the wilderness. He guided them. He leads them into battle. And then we see Jude say, must I remind you that it was Jesus who led you out of Egypt? He says, Jesus, because who is the glory of God, the hand of God, Jesus, the word of God, Jesus. So our Lord didn't just start being that compassionate Lord that will guide his people in John 1, 1. Amen to that. That from day one, this is our God. Not just not just all the time with the people that you think deserve it. Cain murders his brother. I'll make sure that you don't get killed. But wear this sign on you. Mm-hmm. I will guide my people. The only time he's not with them is when he gives them over to someone and yet he's still with them, as we'll read in Daniel. And what he does is even when he gives them over, he will make sure that he's the one in charge by doing things like giving dreams that only he can give the answers to. So you got to use his people. So Come on. remember, this is who your God is. He never leaves your side when he is with you. Amen. 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 So we see that uh, again and again. So thanks for that, Mike. And at the command of the Lord, they camped. And at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord um, at the command of the Lord by Moses. So again, just that beautiful, the mouthpiece. Um, I didn't even realize you were at the end of the chapter. I should have let you finish. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's all good because this is also just like a beautiful teaching moment where it says at the command of the Lord by Moses. So oftentimes when people say, and, and, and I think we touched on this as well in so many episodes is, is, is this Mike's never going to do the saving. JD is never going to do the saving. No evangelist, no, no apostle, no prophet ever did the saving. It, it's the Lord who spoke through his mouthpieces. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. So Moses was the mouthpiece. That's it. Um, and and the same thing applies. They had the the oral, um, you know, the verbal instruction from God Himself. Today, when we when we as Christians go, okay, well, we want to hear God speak, um, and this is why I'm very very skeptical with 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 people who say God told me. And, you know, it's when someone opens up their mouth and they say God told me this. I'm like, where did He tell you this? Which chapter? Which verse? And they're like, no, no, no. Um, he, he verbally told me this. Um, we can look at them and go, well, that's just not how it works today. Um, because all scripture is breathed out by God and it's got every single thing we need instruction in righteousness, rebuke, ex- exhortation. You know, we know that every bit of wor- every bit of God's word is for us today. So, this was the oral time that that Hebrews one speaks of, and, and and just like I say, this is just a reminder before we jump into chapter ten that Hebrews one one makes this abundantly clear that that God did speak through prophets for an appointed time, but now He speaks through His Son Jesus Christ. So why am I mentioning this? Just just as Mike did with Jude, you know, this was Christ. In the garden, we see Christ with, with Adam and Eve. God God walked among them. So this is the pre-incarnate Christ. What he looked like? What Did he appear in the same form to each and every single one of them every time? Um, uh, Dr. Michael Heiser speaks of the angel of the Lord. We can also, so, so there's, there's very, there's a lot of, a lot of information to unpack when it comes to the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, the burning bush, you know, with Moses, I am what I am. Um, so it's a real deep dive. If you want to do that study, by all means, go ahead and do that study. But um, what we see uh, is that God spoke through Moses. And they knew that what Moses was saying was from God directly because he was the appointed prophet of God. And throughout the Old Testament, this is a, a trend we see that when God appointed a prophet, that prophet would be a prophet to whichever people. God did not have five or 600 prophets in Israel at a time like today in, in modern America, modern South Africa, modern, you know, modern world we live in. 
there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of prophets who are all prophesying that Trump would be president and, and failed. And I'm just using that as an example. Why? Because you're liars and you don't know the voice of God. If you did, you wouldn't speak so flippantly and so carelessly. Oh, I was muted. Amen, brother. Amen. Let's go ahead and keep rolling into Numbers chapter 10. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, make two silver trumpets of hammered work. You shall make them and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for breaking camp. And when both are blown, all the congregations shall gather themselves to you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the chiefs, the heads of the tribes of Israel shall gather themselves to you. When you blow an alarm, the camps that are on the east side shall set out. And when you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that are on the south side shall set out. I, I want to stop and just remind you, for those that remember in the previous episodes, we've uh, discussed the way that they would form the camps. And it actually looks like a cross. And this was a way to keep the uh, tent of meeting safe in the center. Uh, so just remember that as you see, again, this order and structure being set on how these horns will be. And if you hear this horn and this, and this is what this means. And again, important history can be dry. Sometimes when you blow an alarm, the camps that are on the East side shall set out. And when you blow an alarm, the second time, the camps that are on the South side shall set out An alarm is to be blown whenever they are, whenever they are to set out. But when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow a long blast, but you shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests shall blow the trumpets. The trumpets shall be to you for a perpetual statute throughout your generations. And when you go to war in your land against the adversary who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. Continuing in verse 10. On the day of your gladness also, and at your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. They shall be a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord your God. In the second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of the testi testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai. And the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. They set out for the first time at the command of the Lord by Moses. The standard of the camp of the people of Judah set out first by their companies. And over their company was Nishan, the son of Amadab. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Issachar was Nathaniel, Nathaniel and the son of Zuar. Right, let me go ahead and correct that. Nathaniel, the son of Zuar. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Zebulun was Eliab, the son of Helan. And when the tabernacle was taken down, the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari, who carried the tabernacle, set out. And the standard of the camp of Reuben set out by their companies. And over the company was Eleazar, the son of Shadur. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Simeon was Shelemiel, the son of Zerashadai. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Gad, was Eliasaph, the son of Deol. Then the Kohathites set out carrying the holy things, and the tabernacle was set up before their arrival. And the standard of the camp of the people of Ephraim set out by their companies, and over their company was Elishama, the son of Amahad. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Manasseh was Gamaliel, the son of Padazer. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Benjamin was Abaddon, the son of Gideononi. When the standard of the camp of the people of Dan, acting as the rear guard of all the camps, set out by the companies over their company was Ahiazer, the son of Amashadai. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Asher was Pagiel, the son of Akron. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Nephtali was Ahira, the son of Anan. This was the order of march of the people of Israel by their companies when they set out. And Moses said to Habab, the son of Ruo, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will do good to you, for the Lord has promised good to Israel. But he said to him, I will not go. I will depart my own land and to my kindred. I will depart to my own land and to my kindred. 
And he said, please do not leave us for, you know, where we should camp in the wilderness and you will serve as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same will we do to you. So they set out from the Mount of the Lord three days journey and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them three days journey to seek out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day whenever they set out from the camp. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. Amen. Oh, man. So whew, Amen. there's some names in there. Let me just say right there. So had to deal with some names. But the end of that is where, I, so the beginning you see this marching instruction, right? So let's summarize it, right? Let's get a picture of what's going on to make this a little bit more digestible for you, right? We see the marching orders, right? This is the early point of their early time in the wilderness. And they're being order to start moving at this point and we see them marching out we see them separating and moving and i love this little this little moment at the very end that describes that whenever the ark moved moses would say arise o lord and let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you and when it rested he would say return o lord to the ten thousand thousands of israel now Amen. You could just gloss over that and be like, okay, that's, you know, what's he doing? Like by saying, arise, O Lord, right? He's not commanding the Lord to arise, obviously. It's, Amen. this is praising his name. Like, I know what God, if you know what God's going to do, you're not commanding him by saying, arise, O Lord, right? I know you're going to. In fact, uh, 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 uh <laughs> come and finish the job, O Lord, right? I'm not commanding him to do it. You're going to do it, you know? Bring glory upon your name, O Lord. Uh, so yeah. it's just praise and glory, but every time they moved, not just the first couple times, and then you became a normal Christian every day moving. Remember when you first started moving with the Lord and you praised him everywhere you went? Why don't you yeah. keep doing that? Why does that fade away? Yeah. And because our journey as Christianity, uh, the reason I think the wilderness is such a great place for us to study when we do grow in our faith is because that's our whole walk. We get saved out of sin, which is Egypt. And the promised land is the kingdom with the sun. So that means my entire walk as a Christian is in the spiritual wilderness. This yeah. is this is all the foreshadowing of what would, would, would come. And just I'm like out. the Lord stayed with us in the tent of meeting animal skins, he now dwells within us in our flesh because he came and dwelt amongst us. And I can yeah. trust that he will continue us moving. So every morning before this ark moves, if he's residing in me, arise, O Lord. And let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. And when I go to rest that night, Lord, come rest before all of us. Like, and I'm not saying you got to do what Moses did here, but if you the ark, if you a temple of God, when you wake and you're about to start moving today, praise his name. Cause you just like if you if you've been on the podcast, if we forget to pray, what will we do? We'll stop and say, Hey, you didn't need our invite, but let's let's invite you into our conversation, Lord. God don't yeah. need your invite, but he's given you the privilege to know him. So if you got his number now, why not call him? Like God don't Amen. need none of us to call him, but he gives yeah. some, of, some of us his number. So I just wanted, I, I wanted to just put that right there for you. And then I'm going to scroll down for you and let you take over. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. And I, I was explaining this to someone the other day. You know, when you look at the Exodus story, uh, they're, they they leave Egypt. They're already free. They're already free. They're already saved from slavery. V much like us today. When when you're born again, when you're regened in Christ, you're already free. You're no longer a slave to sin. And you can see the parallel there. But they wandered the desert for 40 years. So this is sanctification. This is that process. And look what happens next. The people start complaining. Now, these are the same people who witness a fiery cloud by night and a thick cloud by day. Man, oh man, this is incredible when you look at the, the parallel again. We read this and you go, wow, how did they do this? Do we not find ourselves complaining constantly to God about misfortune rather than going up to the very previous verse where, where Moses exalts God and praises him. Um, so yeah, let's dive into this. 
chapter 11. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses and Moses prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So the name of that place was called Tabera because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now, the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Do you, do you see how bitterly they complain? They actually missed captivity because of the luxuries they received in captivity. There is no difference today. And, and this is the narrative, and this is the picture I want to paint for you guys, the analogy here. We today see people that are so caught up with their earthly goods, with the, the spoils that life offers, the fancy restaurants, the convenience of driving through a drive through the fast food places, everything at your fingertips. You can order your groceries on an app. You can get everything you want at the flick of a switch. And, but they are slaves. They're slaves to sin. They're slaves to the world. As, as we've just gone through Ephesians, they're obeying the prince of darkness. They're still trapped. So despite all these luxuries that people think they have, they, they look back to, we were slaves, yes, but we ate this, this, and that. Now as Christians, we're free from that bondage. We're free from that slavery. Why are we looking back to the things we once had while we were slaves? Just ponder on that for a moment. Let that sink in and, and, and see that there's no difference between the first Israelites who, who escaped slavery and were given the law of God to Christians today, who still look back at their old lives going, but at least I had blah, blah, blah. Whatever it might be, whether it be a relationship, whether it be things, whether it be a job, whatever it be that God has removed from you or taken away from you in order to save you, look to God. Don't look to the things that you once had outside of God. Could could it be, brother, if if yeah. we just if we would just bounce us around in our minds that this is the product of people that weren't pursuing God, however. They were following the crowd to escape the things they didn't want, the pains of sin, because the whole world hates sin. Let's just be, <laughs> no one like, yes, there's people that love their own sins, but the whole world hates mm -hmm. sin. Yeah, there's nobody likes sin against them. Nobody likes yeah. sin against certain things or certain areas. The whole world hates sin. And the whole world yeah. knows that there's a problem. And they don't, they don't know that problem is sin, but they know there's a problem and they're running from that problem. And they're yeah. always looking for the way to get away from it. Just like a, a Jew in Israel sees like, hey, we about to get out of here. God said it. Like, bro, I really don't care about this God character, but we about to dip out of here? Like, we about to go? And likewise, yeah. in today's society, we see it. Are you suffering from anxiety and, and the struggles of this life? And Jesus has something better for you. Like, yeah, I want to get out of this. So... Yeah. What's up? What's up, Jesus? Yeah. But then what Amen. happens? If you don't actually believe what God has for you, you start reminiscing on what you want. Because if you mm. knew what God had for you, that's what you would want. Mm. He came for spiritual bread and oh, you no. worried about cucumbers and melons. Like, and yeah, that's man. the problem. People go into mm. Christianity and they miss the very thing that they gave up because they never were pursuing Christ. They were pursuing getting away from something. They were running from that's something. It. But not on, sin no. in general, because there's certain sin they still loved. They was running mm. from the sins they don't like. And same thing mm. with here. They was running from Egypt, the sin they don't like, but they wasn't running from the sin of themselves. And that's that's really what we need to be running from. Not Egypt. You need to be running from the sin within yourself because Egypt was just playing a part in this sinful world. Like you're gonna find that wherever you run to. 
<laughs> I joined the Marine Corps thinking I was running away from sin in New Jersey and didn't realize I was running from myself. I brought the sin with me. So here it is again in the wilderness. Exactly. Exactly. And guys, I just want to I just want to point something out. It's going to tell us right now in verse seven. And the manna was like coriander seed and its appearance was like that of delium. Now, the this is sweet bread. This is like freshly. I, I want you to just imagine for a second. This is not your standard prepackaged white loaf that you get off the shelf. This is bread from heaven. OK, <laughs> let's just remember that the people were complaining about receiving bread from heaven wrap your head around that for a second the people went about and gathered it and ground it in the handmills or beat it in mortars and boiled it in pots and made cakes of it and the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil and when the dew fell upon the camp in the night the manna fell with it and moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans Everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly. Can you imagine giving people bread from heaven and they're moaning about it? Moses was displeased, and Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I not conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all this people? Well, they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. Man, mm. oh man. JD. Man, oh man. Woo. Oh. Hey. 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 Come on, bro. Hey. Mm. Where's, the, where's the, hold on. We don't do this much in the Bible room, but. Come on, man. <laughs> I needed it because, one. brother. This is this is evidence of one. Mo the Bible is not a book about a bunch of great men. That's number one. It's a book about a bunch of broken men with a great God behind them. Number Amen. two, where am I to do this? I can't do this. That's you're right because only Jesus can. Moses mm -hmm. was given the fleshly burden of Jesus. Not even the not even the full fleshly, but like some of it, right? Like this little burden because you know that we know that the Old Testament these characters play the type of Christ, right? Moses leading them out of captivity. Noah leading them, but can't even handle it. You need, this is true. You can't do it on your own. And it's okay to go to God about it. God's a big boy. People get so worried. Like, I, I think I blasphemed the Holy Spirit. What, what did you do, buddy? Well, I was in a prayer and I got mad at God. God God's a big boy now. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not giving you permission to blaspheme God. <laughs> I'm mm. not saying that. But he's not a child. Like Moses goes to him and contends with him. It's like with your child and coming to his father. Dad actually might crack a smile a little bit if you see some confidence in him. Like, look at you, son. Thank you. Thank you about to come over here and tell me something. But he goes to him and says, Lord, how am I supposed to do this? And we're going to see the answer. And we know the long-term answer. But, J.D., I love that. Just the way you read it. I don't know. It just felt so powerful that you see Man. this. Where he's like, this people are such a burden, and God, Jesus is going to do this for the world, and he's going to do it perfectly. Like, and it's just, and as someone who wants to help people, I also read this from a different place, and I bet you do too. Of yeah, that, yeah. Lord, why would you trust me with people? Yeah, <laughs> Lord, yeah. Why, what did you do? What are you doing, Lord? Yeah, yeah, and especially when when you've got like. And, you know, you've always got like a handful of believers who just don't seem to grow. Um, and and you can imagine Moses' frustration here. Like, again, we, we have to preface this by saying they've witnessed some things we will never see. They've seen an ocean part. 
They've seen plagues fall upon Egypt. They've seen the spirit of death pass over and take because God commanded it so. They've walked through a parted sea. They've crossed the desert. They've seen a blazing fire, fire at night. They've, they've seen fire encamp their entire, you know, surround their entire camp. They've seen God's glory in a way that most Christians today would never, ever see. But then we have this grace. We you make it even grace. worse for me now. Now I'm even, yeah. imagine it. Now I really get Moses. Like, Lord, they not eat. What's, these people just kill me, Lord. Can you imagine? You it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, his mind has got to be cooked by now. He's been like, like, I don't physically know what to do at this point because, like, they've seen God. It's, it's not even a question. Like, what are they doing? Like, why are you giving me this responsibility? When And, and I love this, where he says at, at, in verse 15, if you will treat me like this, kill me at once. And if I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness, that's where he goes. What a, I mean, come on, God is good, amen. And then, uh, the I highlighted the Lord blazed hotly, the anger of the Lord. And then it says, Moses was displeased. But the verbiage of this at first, you can maybe think that it says Moses displeased with like the Lord kind of, but no, Moses is displeased just as the Lord is angry. But that's the thing we see here the Lord is angry at us. Not us, obviously, right? We're, we're talking from Israel's point of view, but angry at them. And here comes Moses like, Lord, what, 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 do, you, what do you want me to do with these people? Let's, let's keep it rolling. Um, all right, J.D. had to hop off real quick. I'm going to continue from verse 16 where we left off. Then the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and offices, officers over them and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you may not bear it, bear it yourself alone and say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall not eat just one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why did we come out of Egypt? But Moses said, the people among whom I am number 600,000 on foot, and you have said, I will give them meat and they may eat a whole month. Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them and be enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them and be enough for them? And the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's hand shortened? I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took down some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Not two men remained in the camp, one named I'm sorry. Now two men remain in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to them, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Now, real quick, let's just pull it back because we just covered a lot right here. A lot. Um, so I want to go back to God's response. So we just read where we have God extremely angry and then Moses disappointed. And you think, Here's Moses saying, I, Lord, kill me. Like, there's no other way to say he get, he's giving up. 
He's, he asks the Lord. We'll read it again. I am not able to carry all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. He didn't say, if I'm not able. No, he said, I can't. Lord, I quit. If you're going to keep doing this, just kill me. Because I can't, Lord. I'm breaking. So now God's angry at Israel because they're over here saying, I miss slavery. And then he's got Moses. Like, I can't do this. What does he do, though? What does is, what is our almighty God do? Again, remember we said this is about learning who God is. Not how would Mike respond? How would Mike respond? Ah, punish Israel. But what does God do? He both punish, this, he doesn't punish them. He disciplines them. What's a punishment? What's a punishment? A punishment is the commencement of judgment and something happens bad. What does he do? He gives them what they asked for in such a surplus that they could never say he's not good because they said what is good is what Egypt did. Oh, wait, what? No, nah, first of all, I'm better than Egypt. I'll give you everything that Egypt could have thought of giving you. In fact, I'll give you tenfold, so much so that you will be tired of it. So not only is he showing that I am the providing God and he provides, but he's also disciplining them in the moment. Not for their uh, his own sake, but for their sake. He could have just disciplined, but he also provides. Because at the same time, they had said, let me scroll back. We remember, oh, oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Right? They said that there. And then later we find them again where it says, uh, you have said for it was better for us in Egypt. You dare say it was better for you in Egypt? Now, God's got you. He's going to not only discipline you, but at the same time, he's going to show you how, no, it's not better in a way that also doesn't seem like he's just answering because you cried about it. And then for Moses, who's ready to quit, he goes from being angry, not at Moses, but he's angry at Israel, gives them what they need, disciplines them, and then gives Moses people to be with him. It says he divided the spirit up. Now, this spirit upon them, language in the Old Testament, I know it's confused some. Like, is that like what's what's going on with us? No. See, we have the spirit in dwelling. So the spirit upon you means the spirit is moving with you, that God is with you. My spirit is with you, right? So let's just use cheesy childhood imagery. You know the image that we have of a guardian angel, like everybody has a guardian angel. Imagine the spirit of God upon a man that's like a guardian angel, right? And just again, someone's going to get upset at the imagery I'm trying to use here. The spirit of the God is spirit of God is with him. Now, here's the thing. You might think, well, so he split it up and gave it to them. So does it like divided somehow? No, because even God says, am I shorthanded? And I love that response because this is something that always kills me here. And, and, and I forgot the Bible said this. That's why I kind of like was like, oh, when I said it, it was like a like a bar when I heard it. Because I've met people that say, you know, like, I feel bad about praying because there's people that have more needs than me. And I've done this, too. And I've rebuked myself mid prayer for daring to doubt the power of God. Like, Lord, you don't got to bless me with anything, but I got brothers like JD and where he's at and people that are struggling all over this world. And then you hear it in your heart saying, can I not handle it all? <laughs> Wait, you, do you think you're doing me a favor or are you just being humble to a proud point? Like, Lord, just go ahead and bless someone else. You're not going to reverse psychology God and he's not shorthanded. In fact, thinking that he can't bless you and bless others is doubting him. So what does he say? Is the Lord's hand shorted, shortened? Now you shall see whether my word will come true to you or not. So. On top of all of this, he's answering because he's saying, I will not let you think I can't do. But at the same time, you're not about to get this free gift. You're going to get disciplined in it. It's beautiful. Like, oh, you think I can't provide meat. I will do that so much so that you're tired of it. And then Moses had the nerve to still question him. Where? And Moses' head might be in the right place if you really think about it. He's worried about the oxen. Like, so we're going to be slaughtering things and or do we have to go catch fish? Because remember, a minute ago, Moses is stressed out about the burden that he has. And then God says, y'all going to eat more than enough every single month, uh, a day for an entire month. So Moses' first response was, Lord, I said I was really not able to handle this. Did you just say I got to go slaughter all these uh, uh, animals and catch all these fish? 
<laughs> it's a moment right here that we see happening between Moses and the Lord where, where Moses is really growing and learning, right? But so are we learning about who our God is, learning about who he is. Then we see a little bit further down that the spirit wasn't just limited there. It was elsewhere. And they said, hey, they shouldn't be doing that. He said, are you, are you jealous of me? It's almost like Jesus in Mark chapter nine when they said, hey, they was over there doing things in your name. And he said, don't don't stop them. Anyone does something in my name. Surely they shall not lose their reward. Now, real quick, before we continue that word prophesying, uh, I think that we all well, not we all. But a lot of Christians will pretend that they fully understand what that word means, but they're scared to ask. And yet right here, what are you ma imagining when you close your eyes? When when you read and they prophesied, you think someone like their eyes roll in the back of their head. They speak it in tongues. I hope not. I hope you don't think that what this looks like is someone out there talking about. Shada -ka -shada. Can I be honest with you? You most likely have heard what this sounds like in your life, depending on where you live. You've heard street preachers. Thus says the Lord. Heavenly hosts, qu quoting what the word of God is. They're prophesying his word. Prophecy is to declare the will of God. It wasn't new prophecy. It wasn't new revelation. Every time, if you were to be walking down the street and someone suddenly just starts going, thus says the Lord, the, the king, of uh, the king, the heavenly hosts who will be returning and doing this, and, and they're going literally scripture, like you know the scripture they're quoting, and it's not wrong. It's 100% accurate. That's prophesying. It doesn't always have to be some type of uh, uh, idea of everybody thinks that the miraculous has to then look Hollywood. God's miracles don't have to look Hollywood. In fact, you probably wouldn't even notice a miracle unless it actually happens to you. Just like when Jesus made water into wine, he didn't just say, snap, wine appears, but he used what exists already to make the miracle happen. Let's keep going. Verse 31, then a wind from the Lord sprang up and it brought quail from the sea and let them fall beside the camp about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side around the camp and about two cubits above the ground. And the people rose all that day and all that and all night and all the next day and gathered the quail. Those who gathered least gathered 10 homers and then and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. Therefore, the name of that place was called Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had the craving. From Kibroth Hatava, the people journeyed to Hazaroth, and they remained at Hazaroth. So, I wish JD was back because I would love to ask him what his opinion is on this matter. We see certain people getting struck down right here, right? And who was it? While their meat was yet, while the meat was yet between their teeth before it was consumed, right? We see that uh, uh, this group did they rush? Let me see. The people rose all that day and all that night and all the next day and gathered the quail. Those who gathered least gathered ten homers and they spread them out for themselves all around camp. Okay, so these are the people trying to keep. Uh, grab a couple, grab a lease. They weren't grabbing it for others and they were just grabbing it for themselves. Okay. I, I missed how I was reading that for a second. I go, oh, wait, wait, wait. Did the Lord just strike them all down? So JD is still, I know, um, helping out, uh, or not helping out, but handling breakfast duty uh, over there. Let me see how many verses. So this is a very short chapter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish chapter 12. And if he makes it back in time or not, uh, uh, we will finish up after chapter 12 and we'll go from there. So chapter 12. Miriam and Aaron opposed Moses. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman, and they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man, Moses, was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. I, I want to stop for a second, and this isn't even related to what we're talking about in this chapter. Every time he this, this sentence happens, I've wanted to mention something. The Lord comes, so we see the Lord in a, a, a pillar, uh, pillar of clouds, right? 
But then we see these moments where the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. And it, it, it kind of verbiage, the verbiage is a little bit different as if the Lord is in it, coming down in it. And it makes me think of Daniel 7 when it says the son of man riding on the clouds. And it talks about throughout scripture that God is the one who rides the clouds. There's no one that rides the clouds but God. This is actually also in early Mesopotamian area. This is a reference to any type of deity. You would say like they ride the clouds. And we know that our God says, no, 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 I'm the one that rides the clouds, Daniel 7, right? So we talk about the pre-incarnate Christ, and that's who people saw because John chapter 1 says no one's ever seen the Father. So when God comes to meet with them, what we're seeing is Christ riding the clouds like it says in Daniel 7 and coming down and talking. So riding the clouds, talk about God's almightiness, right? <laughs> but here we go. And the three of them came out and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent. See, it says the Lord came down and stood, came down and stood there. Right. So we have to understand that we see this this imagery of the physical representation of God standing on earth many times in the Old Testament. And he said, I'm sorry, and called Aaron and Miriam and they both came forward and he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. And that's Yahweh right there. Amen. He, just, man, they're, they're, they're over here talking about, what, hasn't the Lord spoken through us? And you know what? Oh, man, let me stop for a second. Hold up, JD. I heard you come back. Hold up. For the modern prophets, you want to know the difference between prophesying and a prophet? The Lord thy God about to tell you this right now. Because let's be very Amen. simple. Let's be very. We see prophets and there's certain types of prophets and they have seen the Lord. Right. Or at least his the word of the Lord comes upon them in ways. And we know that the one coming was after Moses was like Jesus. And here we see. There are some that the Lord myself will make myself known in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant, Moses. He is faithful in all my house. And he says, with him, it's clear. I speak to him. Like, And what is Moses? He's not like, we don't know the names of any of these prophets that God's talking about right now. Why? Because they weren't bringing anything new. Notice how God's saying, yeah, if, if, I, if there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him. I, make, I give yeah. him a vision. I give him some information to help him out, to guide him. But... My revelation, who I stand with, I speak with him clearly, not in riddles. I wonder what the cross reference is there. Psalm 49, I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of lie. I wonder, what, wonder why that was a um, cross reference. It's just, it's, it's just some, this, this is one thing with, with uh, logo. Some of the cross, cross references are purely because the word is used. Yeah, the word, yeah. Well, yeah, and he beholds the form of my Lord, of the Lord, which is interesting because he came down and then does this to them to make this clear. So he doesn't speak to them via a vision or anything. He comes down and speaks to them the way he says he speaks to Moses, saying that it's serious for Moses, which also implies the fact that you're seeing me right now and I'm speaking with you. <laughs> I love this right here. Oh, yeah. and then it says uh, the form of the Lord. Why then were were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And then the anger of the Lord was kindled against them and he departed. He didn't even really give them a chance. He just came, spoke, rhetorical question, uh, uh, and, and dipped up out of there. And then I'm going to just end this chapter real quick, JD, and then you can uh, hop in as we finish up. Uh, and when the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, oh, my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, oh, God, please heal her, please. But the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days. And after that, she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march till Miriam was brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hezeroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. And 
where you were gone, JD, I said this will be our last chapter, and and because I know yeah. you have stuff to do, but talk about something that you've actually mentioned several times. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, but w- that that forgiveness and grace we see, because here we have yeah. they are like conniving against Moses, and God knows yeah. what Moses' yeah. purpose is. We're talking about salvation of the world. The, yeah. the Israelites yeah. don't realize this, and yeah. he could kill them, and he has done things like that. So he he rebukes them. And he does it in a way that like confirms how things are the order, the fact, you know what it is, JD, we have a problem of thinking certain situations can only be handled with certain emotions because we can only split up our emotions so much, but God handles every situation fully with love, fully with justice, fully with mercy, fully with wrath. Like it's all present, full on punishment. You will be disciplined for seven days. You will receive this. Just like with the meat, like, oh, I'm going to give you the meat you wanted, but you're going to hate it. Like, it's it's so beautiful to watch God work in the Old Testament. And the only people that get mad at this are people that want God to let them be God. Like, that's not fair. Yeah, yeah. There's consequences yeah, and responsibilities. Yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's kind of like the uh, Watergate scandal, isn't it? It's like it's illegal until the president does it. Then it's no longer illegal. Um. And, and this is ultimately the way people want to live their lives. Like, I don't want it done to me, but it's okay if I do it to others. Um, and, 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 and this is, this is the same with, you know, touching on what we spoke about last, last night's episode, um, you know, knowing God, if, if these modern day prophets had any reverence whatsoever for the word of God, amen, any reverence for the word of God. And I mean, any reverence they would not speak the way they speak because i don't know about you bro but for me if i read through especially when we get to joshua now and uh, we go through deuteronomy we get to joshua and we start seeing how god goes in battle you you must be like all sorts of stupid to be speaking for god like with such confidence like to me it's 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 borderline retarded because you you you're actually making claims you're making claims on behalf of god when god himself has never made those claims like you you we we had this you know seeing as we done with the with the episode we had this 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 clown south african prophet come out um like three three or four weeks ago um because it was a final um manchester united were playing manchester city in the fa cup final and now he comes out on a sunday service and he says this with such confidence he says uh here you go i'll give you guys something for those of you who like to place bets on sports teams god has shown me i saw the match already he says I saw the match already. Manchester City are winning with <laughs> Manchester City are winning three three to one, and he, he said this with such confidence. And then <laughs> Manchester United end up ended up winning the match two one. So it went to the opposing team, the one that he said would would lose one, and he also claimed he had already seen the match in the future. God showed him the full match. He told the goal scorers and. This was the score and everything. And yet, completely false prophecy. And the following Sunday, despite his false prophecy, his church is packed again. It's just beyond ridiculous. So uh, the way this chapter ends is just phenomenal. And I wish, or I pray rather, that more, more, more people would actually read their Bibles. Uh, especially these false prophets who think they know everything about everything. Amen. And with that being said, we will be bringing this episode to a close. Thank you guys so much for joining in. Make sure that you guys are back every Friday at 8 a.m. Uh, for the new weekly episode for the Bible reading. Also, if you're just stumbling across here and you're not aware, we have a podcast every Monday and Wednesday, 9 p.m. Central. Uh, it's live uh, on Mondays and Wednesdays, but you can always check it out after the fact on YouTube or on Spotify or Apple. We thank you guys always for being here. And as always... God bless and go in peace.